This is not the DaVinci Resolve Speed Editor. This is my own video editing deck. Let me tell you the story. Since starting this YouTube channel, I started editing videos on a daily basis. I am not a professional, but I do have some experience in the field. I'm using my MacBook to edit, and I've switched from using Premiere Pro to DaVinci Resolve in recent months. It's taken a bit of getting used to, but finally I'm proficient in switching from the selection tool to the blade tool. There's a small problem though, I'm using the B key to switch to the blade tool and often I hit the N key by mistake, which turns off the magnetic timeline and the cuts I make are far from surgical. This poses a problem, leaving me with blank spots in my timeline. This is an issue for me because with making projects the most important part is finishing them and by having tiny setbacks and roadblocks every few minutes my motivation to go on drops and the project risks suspension or even worse abandonment. That's why I decided to let go of the keyboard and make my own controller. It is going to work together with a mouse or trackpad so I'll be fine unless I need to add captions or text. The most important feature is switching the two tools I most often use, and a genius idea came to mind. I will toggle between them using the same single button. The rest of the keys will be mapped to basic tools and shortcuts. DaVinci Resolve has the 7 tabs in the bottom, which are designed to focus on specific areas of editing. It would be nice to map them to buttons, since I use almost all of them occasionally. So let's review, we have the most used tools, macros, switching tabs and finally we need an encoder. The encoder can be used in various ways, for example in the cut tab we can quickly add footage to the timeline, in the edit tab we can scrub through the timeline, zoom in and out and we can toggle between timeline and media pool view and use the encoder in both places. I will focus on making it work in the edit tab initially since that is what I use almost exclusively. We'll go through all the functionalities a bit later. We need to build it first. Give me a second while I quickly test everything out on a breadboard. Look at all of this mess, I haven't even added the mechanical switches yet. How am I supposed to solder all these wires by hand? Well, thanks to today's sponsor, I don't have to. I created my schematic using EasyEDA, the online tool for circuit design, created the PCB, made all the connections, automatically mostly using the auto router, and took the Gerber file straight to JLC PCB, the sponsor of today's video. JLC PCB manufactures high quality PCBs at the lowest prices. They also provide flexible PCBs, PCB assembly, 3D printing, CNC machining, mechatronic parts and more. For this project, getting PCBs made by JLC PCB is a piece of cake. You can simply drag your Gerber files to their website, select the cover of the PCBs, they make any of these covers at no additional cost, and they offer 5 PCBs for $2 for sizes up to 10 by 10 cm. Mine were a bit bigger than that, but that was no issue for JLC PCB. The PCBs arrived after only 6 days, which was amazing for the project timeline. They were packaged perfectly and looking at the PCBs themselves, they are indeed very high quality. If you want to get your PCBs made, use the link in the description and get a new user discount coupon. Thanks to JLC PCB for sponsoring this video. So let's start working on the PCB. The easiest way to proceed is to gather all the components and reuse the ones I placed on the breadboard earlier. Every component and their placement are clearly marked on the PCB. So let's disassemble the breadboard and take out the components. We have two 16 channel multiplexers, one 8 channel multiplexer, the Arduino Pro Micro, 8 red LEDs and 8 220 ohm resistors, 8 push buttons and 23 mechanical switches. We can start placing the multiplexers and the Arduino Pro Micro on the back side of the PCB first. Next, I apply some cheap flux, which is not mandatory, and I found out the hard way I should never use this cheap flux anymore, because it leaves very sticky residue on the board, which was very hard to clean. Once they are all soldered, we can add the resistors as well, since they go on the backside too. It doesn't matter which way you put them in, but I made sure they all match their color band direction.
we can continue soldering them and cutting off the excess legs. So next we can proceed by adding the 8 LEDs, taking note of the positive and negative terminals on the PCB, placing the longer leg in the positive terminal. I did manage to place them backwards on the board, like a boss, so I took them out and turned the board around to place them correctly. Next we can add the encoder and this time I had to check the board orientation 3 times after the whole backwards LEDs fiasco. Now when it comes to the push buttons I got a matching set of white caps for them to have a more minimalistic design for the whole controller. We can go ahead and solder them as well. The final step is to cut all the legs sticking out, but be careful because some of them are very thick, like the microcontroller legs, and they tend to hurt when they fly out. Use protective gear because they may hurt you. Now I use some ethanol to clean the board, but it was hard to take out the flux residue. I will try to use isopropyl alcohol next time. Now it is time to put the controller in the 3D printed enclosure. This enclosure is very minimalistic and very short compared to my other ones, thanks to the PCB. We can prepare the enclosure by adding heat set inserts so the screws don't eat out the plastic. We can now insert the PCB in the enclosure and screw it in place. Due to the nature of the design, the PCB fits neatly inside the enclosure without the mechanical switches installed. The top of the enclosure acts as a plate to which the mechanical keys click in and then they are soldered to the PCB. This will make repairing the device a bit harder, but it allows for a much cleaner look. So when inserting the mechanical switches, we need to be careful not to bend the pins, and we need to check whether they pass through the other side of the PCB. The process is straightforward, but we need to check each switch separately. Finally, we give the PCB the finger test and after we get the approval, we can just solder each switch and with that, this project is complete. Well, it's not complete until we add the encoder cap and all the caps for the switches. But now it truly is complete. Oh, uh, one more thing. We need to add the back plate and screw it in place. And now it is comp. Wait, wait, come on, man. We can finally add these massive silicone pads so the controller doesn't move around on our desk. And now the project is complete.
Let's look at the edit page integration. We use this button to switch the active workspace to the edit page. This button toggles between the selection tool and the blade tool. This one performs a razor cut where the playhead is at. This one selects the nearest clip or gap, so when we move through the timeline, we can select the clip under the playhead, and this one toggles the magnetic timeline, also known as snapping. The next three are J, K and L, meaning play backwards, stop and play forward. This here is the enter key, and this one is the backspace, which deletes clips without ripple. This one here is a toggle between the timeline and the media source. So this button switches both the video playback screen and the currently focused working area, from the timeline to the media selection. We can use the encoder to scrub through the timeline and if we click it, we get its second functionality to zoom in and out on the timeline. If we switch to source mode by pressing this button, the encoder is used to navigate the media pool in the horizontal direction. And if we click it, we navigate in the vertical direction. We can use these two buttons to set an in and out for the selected clip from the media pool and we can use this button to insert the selection to where the playhead is currently at. These two buttons are used to trim the start and the end of the clip under the playhead. These four buttons are used for undo, redo, copy and paste shortcuts. The other four buttons are currently unassigned but they can be mapped to any desired function. And that's how easy it is to edit without the keyboard. Now I need to tell you something important. All the project files, including the schematic, the PCB design, the Arduino code and 3D model files are free to download from my website. You can use them to build your own controller exactly the same as this one. You can order your own PCBs from JLC PCB by uploading the Gerber files and you can 3D print your own enclosure. With that being said, I do also sell DIY kits available on my website, which contain a PCB, all the components needed and a 3D printed enclosure. By purchasing a kit, you support the channel and the work I do, allowing me to build more controllers for you. If you don't want to buy a DIY kit and you want to build the controller yourself, please consider buying me a coffee on my buy me a coffee link in the video description. As a thank you for your support, I decided to give away two DIY kits to two lucky viewers. I will pick the winners on my live stream on my YouTube channel on September 15th. To be able to participate, you need to drop me a comment on this video and tell me which feature you find most useful. So, on the live stream, I will pick one lucky viewer from the comment section of this video and one lucky viewer from the live stream. Remember to join for a chance to win this controller. Also, make sure to check out my other videos, the MIDI controller and the OBS controller projects. So, thank you for watching, my name is Risto and I will see you next time.